we have the opportunity. I'm a big passionate subscriber to the power of risk. Everybody's got their own reasons for climbing Everest. And I like to consider myself as non-judgmental as I can be. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Smartcast and the Jahi events. More about them later. Today's guest. Well, if you want to find out somebody that has really gone to the top of the world over and over again, then my next guest is this person. He summited Everest 16 times. Let me give you a little bit of a rundown. He's one of the world's leading high altitude climbers. As I said, climbed Everest 16 times along with other mountains around the globe. He's the only Brit to ski down two 8,000 meter peaks. Now, if you're not into mountaineering, you're not into climbing, it doesn't matter because this guy is fascinating. Along being one of the global elite guides, Kenton provides guidance on key leadership and team performance criteria to corporate clients. He's a highly engaging, motivational speaker as well. And his ultimate goal is to inspire the next generation. Ever since the young and heady days of his first expedition to Pakistan when he was 19, he's been completely in love with climbing the high mountains. He revels in guiding clients up iconic climbs and to the summit of mountains in the Himalayas, Alps and Alaska and elsewhere. Kenton creates innovative, pioneering challenges and inspirational experiences with clients who can learn from this and apply it to their work and home life. He's mounted and completed over 44 successful expeditions in his career. And today there are many more to come. This guy really is an epic human being who doesn't know the meaning of taking it easy, chilling out and stopping. Cue the music. Let's enjoy this episode. Just a quick one here. Let me just talk about the sponsors to the podcast. Smartcasts are trying to solve the problem of food security in the world. I mean, we really do have a problem. By 2080, there won't be enough food to go around with this ever-growing population. We have climate change, we have soil erosion, and a lot of dramatical negatives are applying to our planet that are impacting us negatively, and they're going to cause us problems. And so Smartcasts have gone out there and they've said, right, how do we solve food security? How do we fix this problem? And they've come up with innovative ways to use smart tech with farming to produce fruits and vegetables for us in a completely different way. 95% less water. That's the first thing. No pesticides, no GMO, really high quality products. Go check them out. Smart Cast Tech on Instagram. That's S-M-A-R-T-K-A-S-T-E-C-H. Give them a follow, send them a message, find out more about what they're doing because they really are making a difference. And I think you should all be paying attention. Najahi events have been sponsoring our podcast since the beginning. They bring motivational speakers, inspirational leaders and educators into the Middle East so that we can benefit from their knowledge and experience. Go and check out Najahi events on Instagram. That's N-A-J-A-H-I events on Instagram. Give them a follow because they really are bringing people into this part of the world that can help us learn, grow, develop and be better human beings and better professionals. I'll see you soon. The reason that I was really interested in talking to you is that um, my wife would describe you as a mad, mad as a box of frogs, and uh, I would describe you as an amazing adventurer. Uh, she thinks that what you do is just absolutely crazy. When I look at what you do, I'm, I'm inspired by it. So maybe let's start off by sharing with the audience some of your great successes. I mean, 16 times up to the top of the biggest mountain in the world. And, and that's not that's not all. That's just like there's just like one part of your success. But let's give people a rundown and then maybe you could explain why you're as mad as you are for the benefit of my wife. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it always seems uh, a little bit indulgent to describe oneself, but um, in a nutshell, I'm a uh, qualified mountain guide, uh, a serial Everest climber. So you already mentioned 16 summits uh, and counting, uh, but that, that is actually done as a professional mountain guide. So I lead people to the top of Everest. Uh, first Brit to ski an 8,000 meter peak, so there's only 14 mountains in the world above 8,000 meters. Uh, so I was the first British person to ski down one. Uh, I enjoyed it so much. I went back and skied another one a few years later. Uh, nominated for the PAA Door, which is a climbing Oscar uh, for an ascent in Nepal uh, back in 2003 or so. 
first ascents pretty much all around the world. But arguably, my proudest achievement is being married to the lovely Jazz and father to two beautiful. Well, I say beautiful. They're on school holiday, so right now they're testing my patience. So they're not quite as beautiful as they often are, but two two beautiful children here in the Cotswolds. So that's a very quick synopsis of who I am. So how did you get into climbing in the first place? What was the attraction? What was your childhood like that led to this? So I was really lucky. Uh, I was born in Slough. Um, <laughs> so for anybody listening to this that's in, in different parts of the world, okay, Slough is about as flat as a pancake and it's got the biggest, I think it's not industrial estate, but the biggest business park or something in the UK. So to give people a sense of it. Yeah, it's, it's often, it's a bit unfair, really. It's often called like the armpit of the UK um, and uh, famous for a poem by the then po poet laureate, uh, Sir John Betjeman, come friendly bombs, come rain on slough. But that is where I was born. I grew up just up the road. And although I lived inside the M25, so essentially I, I was growing up, you know, for want of a better word, in London, um, we had a little wooden bungalow uh, right on the corner of a, of a, of a farm field. And I, I pretty much had free reign to go and play outside, which, you know, let's face it, not everybody has that luxury. My father was unemployed for a lot of my childhood. Uh, we didn't have all the mod cons to um, grab the attention of you know, small children back then. So, so my playground literally was the farm fields, the woods, the river nearby. And I just had this passion for the outdoors. But climbing came a little bit later. And I think one of the advantages of living where I did, uh, just outside Slough, and I, place called Uxbridge is that there was a university, Brunel University, and it had for its time state-of-the-art climbing wall, probably the best, certainly in London uh, back in the day. And, and one of my buddies used to go down there and I just asked him one day, hey, Andy, you know, do you mind taking me down to the climbing wall? And he's like, hey, yeah. I mean, we weren't you know, really good buddies, but um, he took me down to the climbing wall and I instantly fell in love with it. Uh, and I fell in love with it on multiple levels. I, I really loved the, the physical challenge of what climbing gave me. And we very quickly pro progressed from indoor climbing to outdoor climbing. Um, and he had quite an adventurous father, you know, as, as did I for that matter. Uh, mine was a scout leader. Uh, so constantly taking us camping and building fires and zip lines and letting us fall out of trees and that sort of business. Um, but it was Andy who really introduced me to rock climbing uh, just after my A-levels. And then I haven't really looked back. You know, went to Leeds University, super vibrant um, climbing community, collective, club, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you, you just got swept up in the positive energy. Um, and it was simply fantastic. Not a care in the world. Meant to be studying but mine just constantly on climbing and where we're going to go after college, you know, where we're going to go on a Wednesday afternoon, what we're going to do at the weekend. Can't wait to go down the pub and hear what all my mates have been doing. Um, and then to be honest, you know, never look back, uh, graduated Leeds uni, found a job in a climbing shop, literally to fund the habit, to feed the rat, uh, that was inside me. And, just went from there to snowball from there. I just want to do more and more and more. I've got quite an addictive personality and fully fell in you know, with both feet to, uh, to climbing. Did anything else along the way ever sweep you up the way that mining, uh, that climbing did? And mining did. <laughs> mining, yeah. I didn't say mining. I actually studied mining as part of my university degree. So they really? kind of <laughs> exchanged serendipity with what you said there. Um, yeah, I was big into, uh, I used to play a lot of hockey. Uh, I used to play field hockey. Uh, if anybody's listening in the US, we're talking field hockey here, not ice hockey. Um, yeah, I used to play to a relatively high standard. I was a county level player. Uh, and I loved that. I mean, and that consumed my time until I found climbing. I would either play or train four or five days a week, uh, play at the local club, uh, playing in the first team when I was like 15. So. You know, playing with people a lot older than me, you know, much higher standard. Now, I think my first beer was down the hockey club and things like that. So I was 
the, the young, not the young upstart, but I was the, the young guy coming through that was nurtured. And, um, you know, I think that mentoring is actually quite an interesting thing. You know, when somebody takes you under their wing and certainly with hockey, it was a, a myriad of people because it's an 11 a side game. So there's a lot of teammates, but climbing slightly different. I mean, climbing, I did have a mentor. I had a number of mentors, but you know, it works in a slightly different way. Genuinely, when you are climbing, it's just a team of two, sometimes three. So the mentorship is slightly different, but uh, yeah, I, I was, I don't know where I was addicted to hockey, but I just loved it. You know, I loved the community. It gave me a sense of purpose. I love the physicality of it, the competitive nature of it. You see a common thread coming out here, don't you? Um, I, but then I found climbing and kind of dropped hockey and threw myself into, into climbing. I've only just taken hockey up again with some of the mums and dads from school. When you're kind of young, you're, you, you're, you're way less, way more fearless when you're young. You don't see, necessarily see or feel the danger that you do when you get older. A lot of times I look back at some of the stuff I used to do and think, my goodness, what was I up to? And now I'm 52. And I almost can empathize with my parents that sit there and go, oh, that's a little bit, well, be careful with that if I were you. And I'd be like, what are you going on about? You're mad. You going through the years, when, when was it that you first kind of acknowledged in a real sense danger? And did anything happen to you to make you kind of like take risk into the equation much more than just... Um, maybe it loosely that you would in the in the early days i mean it's interesting what you say is I, i've literally you know I, I mentioned earlier my children are on a school holiday and my son's just got a beehive uh and he's been outside literally about two hours ago tending to his bees i know nothing about bees and i'm there watching him going oh my god he's nine he's about to be stung to death uh, and I'm, I'm there like super concerned for him and i think all parents have that protective nature um but I think it's really important to try to let those individuals, you know, the young Spencer, the young Kenton, the young whoever, to to, to learn arguably the hard way, you know, to fall out of the tree, to break the limb, uh, you know, to get hit on the head by a cricket ball or, or whatever it is. You know, I, I'm a big, passionate subscriber to the power of risk. You know, I don't. I'm not talking about taking risk for the sake of taking risk. But by experiencing what doesn't kill us, I mean, it's cliche, what doesn't kill us you know, makes us stronger. Um, and I think I was exposed to that at a relatively early age. Um, I mean, I had my own climbing accident, uh, aged 21, 22, 21, I think. Uh, I fell off rock climbing in North Wales, smashed both my heel, but heel bones, and, and I did a really good job of it. Um, four and a half weeks, in hospital, three, three operations, months in a wheelchair, uh, then crutches. Basically, I had to learn to walk again, uh, having been told I'd never climb, uh, I would never run again. So that was a bit of a leveler. Um, and, and, but interestingly, in the build up to that episode, I did to a certain extent think I was bulletproof because I was trying rock climbs, which looking back on it were way too hard for me at the time. I was taking some big falls. I took an 80 foot fall and hit the sea. Uh, in North Wales once. I was trying a new route in down on the chalk cliffs of Dover, of all places. You can climb it with ice axes and crampons. And I fell off and took another 50 foot fall there. So you know, it was all leading somewhere. Uh, and then I had this big level with, with the accident that did um, hospitalize me. But then at the same time, I was part of a cohort of climbers in North, uh, in North London, um, conveniently called the North London Climbing Club. Uh, you couldn't make that one up, could you? And um, there was so some of the best climbers of the era belonged to this club. Brendan Murphy, uh, Mick Fowler was there for a while, Victor Saunders. Um, and there was an attrition rate. Even when I was that old, there was an attrition rate. You would go down the pub on a Wednesday and you know, one of your climbing buddies is no longer there. You know, they, they, they died. Uh, and the really big one for me, the, the one that really hammered it home how dangerous it was, was Brendan's death in 97, I think it was. So a year after my accident, 97 or 98, he passed away, having done an audacious new route on Shangabang in North India. And he was swept away by an avalanche. And he was considered one of the 
visionary, unsung, leading lights of alpinism um, at the time. A phenomenal rock climber, very quiet. Uh, he was a um, sort of researcher, I think maths or something like that, Cambridge, a super clever dude. And, and, and that, that was sobering, really sobering. That summer, actually, there's about three or four deaths within the North London Club. And it, and it really made you realize that you know, it's a dangerous game. And you've got to approach it with a degree of sensibility. Otherwise, you're going to get hurt, um, seriously hurt. Tell, tell, me, tell me how people around you that have got a relationship with you can can tolerate what you put them through. I look at you know I, I look at my wife and she's genuinely fearful of anything. We go to Italy on Sunday. We're in the Dolomites for a week. We're going paragliding. We're going hiking. We're going mountain biking. And I'm like, so we've got we've got we've got five days of doing all the stuff I like to do. And my two daughters are like, Dad, we can't wait to do it. I know one of my daughters is quite scared, but once you drag her through it, she's fine. But all all my wife is thinking is who's going to die. That's, that's clear in her mind. Someone's going to die. This is just ridiculous. This yeah. is crazy. Who's going to die? And, and I understand the place that she's coming from. But for me, it's like I, I kind of I brush it off because I think she's overreacting. But her reality, her truth is a different world or a different understanding than mine. So have you had people around you that have been fearful of the kind of challenges that you've stepped into and you know, when you go off and do them, they're in a state of panic and worry while you're gone. Yeah, I, I think so. I think anybody close to you is going to have a degree of anxiety. Uh, so, certainly, I mean, I feel it myself. Or, you know, when friends of mine go away on some of these big hills or they're doing an expedition, which I know is inherently relatively dangerous, uh, you know, I, I feel it myself. Um I think my mother and father were probably the first to to um, express some fear, uh, not helped by the fact that, you know, I called them up all those years ago, oh, mum, I'm in Bangor Hospital, I smashed my legs up. So I don't think that helped. Um, <laughs> but then after a while, I think it's, it's, not, it's not a case of people become resigned to it. I think education's a really big thing. Uh, and you know, if we fast forward to you know, meeting my wife, back in 2006 and then sort of children come along in what, 2010 and 12 or whenever uh, and then all of a sudden it, it's no longer just about me and uh, there's some dependence involved as well and, and not only dependence but you know, people who are thoroughly left behind when i go away and do these things uh and, and we've, we've you know we've talked it through at length and, and there's, you know, there's one particular story which you know really hammered home to me it really educated me about how bad it can be for those who are left behind because i think no matter how much educating we do those who are close to us know what the inherent dangers are and no matter how careful we are there's always objective danger there's always something around us you know beyond our control especially when you're climbing on the big hills uh, and it's made doubly hard now by trackers. Uh, we've all got trackers, so you know, on summit day, anybody can log on and, and see where individuals are moving. And it's almost one of those things that too much knowledge can be quite a dangerous thing. Gone is the old age phrase of no news is good news because we are constantly connected. And I think we lose that. You know, a lack of connection through some device could be battery, you know, it could be dropped, it could be you know, lack of signal, whatever it is, but people expect to be all the time. But the story I just wanted to share is we're back in 2013 and it was a throwaway comment to Jazz. I, I, I had this ambition to climb these three mountains, you know, Everest, highest mountain in the world, obviously, uh, Lutsi, fourth highest mountain in the world, and Nutsi, the 19th highest mountain in the world. So I embark on this and my parting comment to Jazz when I left base camp is, Yes, I took to talk to you in three or four days time. It was literally a flippant throwaway comment. A week later, I'm not down at base camp. And I've got caught up in trying to save someone's life. Um, it all got very traumatic. And my logistical provider, a guy called Henry Todd, 
decides that he's going to phone Jazz. But he's going to phone him from a sat phone. And a sat phone has, has a very specific number, plus 811, I think, it, I think it is. And of course, it comes through to Jazz's phone. It's a sat phone number. She knows exactly what a sat phone number looks like. It's not my sat phone number. What does that mean? And in that instant, she goes from, oh, not heard from Kenton, to total panic mode because somebody's calling her and somebody's only going to be calling her if something bad has happened. And bless him, Henry is fully aware of this. And the first thing he blurts out is, don't worry, he's okay. And you're just thinking, wow, I mean, the, the forethought going into that is amazing. And, and all Henry wanted to do was to say to Jazz, he's on his way down, he's done it all. You know, he's had this hiccup with Mr. Leader, Taiwanese climber, that unfortunately didn't work out. But that, it just illustrates the knife edge which those people at home can be under. I mean, Jazz, you know, we met in 2006. Every year I've known her, I've gone to Everest or gone to a big mountain or gone climbing in India or whatever it may be. So if anybody's going to be understanding, it's going to be her. Yeah, at the same time, I think education is super important because you know, this is super flippant. I've arguably got more chance of being run over in London than I have dying on Everest. Now, that's not going to resonate with a lot of people I know, and it sounds really like a throwaway, I'm larger than life, but on Everest, you are totally dialed in. Now, you know it's dangerous, so you are focused. Everything is pinpoint accurate. When you're in London, your mind's all over the place because you, you, you don't think you're going to be hit by a bus. Now, on Everest, I know that it's dangerous. I know that things can go wrong. So the whole team is like on point. I step out in the road in London. Yeah, you know, it can you happen. Can. It happens yeah. all the time. So you know, or go out cycling with my mates and you know get clipped by a car or you know or whatever it may be. I can fall down the goddamn stairs. Uh, there is danger all around us. The thing is, when we do these things, where you're paragliding in a Dolomite, doing a Rio Ferrata, you're focused on what it is that you are doing in the moment. You know it's inherently dangerous. You know the consequences are severe. And because of that, you, know, you, you build a safety net. You, you, know, you, you know what the next move is. You, you, you've got your double lanyards if you're on a Rio Ferrata. You might even have a rope out. You, you, you already know what a descent route is in case there's bad weather coming in. You've got all these contingency plans. Whereas when you get side swiped on a Tuesday afternoon by the unknown, you know, maybe potentially because you're not concentrating. It's really interesting you say that because when I when I'm whenever I'm on a mountain, uh, you know, people say to me, "Why do you like it so much?" and and I describe it slightly differently. But as you're explaining that, it makes me think the same as you. It's I describe it as I think about nothing else when I'm there than what I'm doing, and. That means I can remove every other pain, stress, trouble, headache, drama from my head. And so it escapes me. So it's almost like it releases all of the anxiety, pressure and drama that's going on in my life and just allows me to focus on one thing, which is almost like a freedom in, its, in, in, in essence to me. But you talk about it and you describe it as laser focus on because it's a dangerous situation. And I suppose they're both the same thing, but I've never thought about it like that. It's just like, well, I don't know. I just don't have to think about anything else, which makes me really happy. Does it make yeah, you- I, 100%. I mean, I'm, I'm focused, but I'm in my happy place. Don't get me wrong. You know, I don't think any of us, you know, can really focus on more than, honestly, just one thing. Now, I think even if you start dividing your attention across two or three things. And, and let's face it, you know, I'm sat in this all singing, all dancing laptop and notifi notifications can ping up. I'm trying to do an email and this is happening, that's happening, that. You know, I, I, when our attention gets diluted, nothing gets 100%. When we're climbing or in the mountains, first of all, generally, we're not connected, i.e. the phone's in the pocket, it was in the rucksack, we're not constantly looking at WhatsApp or, Twitter or whatever it is, or better still, God, God forbid, there's no signal. God, wouldn't that be a a, 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 um, you know, a mind cleansing uh, opportunity? Um, and, and and yeah, we, we are focused. You know, we, we are we are looking at 
what's happening around us. We're, we're taking in real time information about our, our environment. And I think because we're not cluttering our brains with noise, we can find an, a, a, an environment, an equilibrium with our conscious, our self-conscious, our inner conscious, our subconscious, mm -hmm. that just makes us happy, you know, because we're not constantly thinking about, oh, I didn't get back to Fred, or, yeah, well, or maybe we are, but it's just in the back of our mind, but we can't do anything about it. You know, we, we can't just pick up a phone and, and send Fred an email right now, and it's cleansing. Uh, it, it really is. And yeah, I'm focused on, on Everest, but at the same time, boy. Well, see, yeah, it's I? interesting you said this because if we go back to your days when you used to play hockey and you say you had an addictive personality and you loved that sense of, 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 of being part of that community, then you got into the climbing community and you love the sense of being part of community. And I think it's really important to, to, to almost acknowledge the importance of community and connection because when I climb, when I go, we, we go on a trip, there's, there's either there's five of us, 10 of us, however many of us there is. And I love being with those people and listening to their stories, no matter how big or how small, during the period of that, 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 that trip. And for me, it's a sense of finding people that are aligned with you in terms of the, the hobby and the interest that they have. They may come from different backgrounds. They may have different levels of, uh, of experience in life at different things. But because you're brought together under one subject matter and that, that thing, that activity you all like to do, it makes me feel really connected to those humans too. Just like you would in a hockey team or just like you would in a football team or whatever it might be. 100% because you've got that common connection. Um, and you know, whether you know these people or not, you know, maybe you meet them in a tea house. So you know, in, in case the audience don't, you know, don't know, when you're trekking to Everest Base Camp, every night you stop in a, in a lodge, which is run by a Sherpa, it's generally called a tea house. And if you're there on your own, then you, you're just going to start talking to other people because it's like a communal dining area you start start a conversation and you have something in common because something has brought you both or three of you or you know the whole tea house there's a reason why you're there now some people are coming back down some people are going up the valley whatever it is but there's a there's a commonality straight away so there's a, a conversation opener right there and it, it's interesting what you're talking about like the connectiveness because I've, I've recently revisited the book uh, Johan Harry, I think his name is, uh, lost connection. And he talks about how connection is, you know, or the, the opposite of addiction uh, is connection. And he talks about depression as well. And, and the, the disadvantage of the way that we are connected or interconnected these days is through social media, it's through a screen, it, you know, whereas in reality, as a species, we crave that connectiveness. And, and it's such a powerful healing tool, um, you know, both for like addiction, depression, general well being. And I mean, we're not talking about just picking up a device and pinging Bob or Harry or Henrietta a message. You know, we're actually talking about meaningful connection exactly in the manner that you're talking about with your cohort of friends when you're going climbing or power gliding. You know, we might all come from a different walk of life, but we have that connection. And, 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 and that is something which I'm really fearful that you know, the next generation is potentially gonna lose unless we deliberately seek it out. Um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, over, certainly over COVID, I mean, how many hours did we spend on Zoom calls and Skype? Well, Skype basically died, didn't it? But you know, whatever, you know, Zoom or Teams and all these sorts of things. I mean, and it's only now that governments are now pouring millions, hundreds of millions into uh, mental ill health in not just the next generation, but the current generation. It's connection. You know, we can keep coming back to community um you know connectiveness uh the you know the culture of who we are it's all interconnected if you break those links then we are we're lost and that's one of the reasons why i found hockey uh and even arguably more so climbing so addictive is because of that connection uh, and i crave it 
almost more than a sport itself. So when I had my accident, I was told you would never climb again. You know, I was mortified more for losing the community that I, I had almost more than anything else. Yes, I mean, of course you find another community, but I already had one. I had one that I was very happy in, and it was the fear of losing that more than anything else that got me back up. You know what, you just said something really that that resonated with me then. You said, you know, the fear of losing a community, however, yeah, you can go and jump into another community, but I was happy with the community I have. I think it's a lot more difficult than that. I think the step to join a community for a lot of people can be really overwhelming, you know? getting into yeah. an environment whether that's you know you go and live in a new city and you've got to make new friends and whatnot i think for some people that's quite intimidating and so once you be- belong somewhere now whether that's i don't know you're a rotarian you're a round tabler you're in the cub scouts doesn't matter what it is yeah. does it you know at the end of the day you know yeah. the people that you work with when you work long hours you know that, that group of people at work once once you're in there yes of course theoretically it's quite easy to leave a community and join a new one but in practice it can be quite overwhelming and intimidating so and i and i found that myself you know my, my, my wife is a, a you know a real social secretary let's call her that you know she was like we're going out to dinner with these people this weekend next weekend we're doing that we've got a birthday party you know i was in spain last week at one of her friend's 40th birthdays and said, we're going to spain because we're going to a 40th birthday i'm like well, well what um <laughs> but if she if she wasn't doing that then I, I would find it a lot easier um, or, or uh, yeah, I'd find it. I wouldn't pursue it. I'd find it a lot easier to be alone, which potentially could lead to loneliness. And loneliness, it has a big impact on a lot of people's lives, particularly men. Mm. Well, well, I mean, loneliness, you know, depression, addiction. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of running away from something uh, more often than not. Uh, when we, you know, start to crave or go down the the dark holes of these two, you know, pretty powerful afflictions. Um, but yeah, I, I fully understand and and also concur to a certain extent with what you say about you know how easy it, it is or isn't to drop in and out of various communities. I, I suppose for me, you know, I've always been well, actually, I'm quite a shy individual. But when pushed into an environment, I just think to myself. What is there to lose? Because ultimately, somebody's going to say, you know, even if they're brutally honest, and let's face it, how many of us are that honest to turn around and say to, to somebody, actually, you know, I'm not interested. You know, we, we don't want you as part of our gang, or you know, there's no room in the hockey club, or, or whatever it is. And it's having that confidence, I suppose, to make that first step. Yeah, and. And, and whatever, you know, it could be the bridge club, it could be the bowls club, it could be the climbing club, you know, it could be the, down the pub, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's just having that competence to, to, to take that first step and then to just say, hi, you know, I'm Kenton, this is where I've come from and this is where I am now. And that's literally, most of the time, that's all it takes. And when we're younger, we don't have these inhibitions. Uh, I, I watch my children make friends when we go to the beach or you know, if we're in the local swimming pool or whatever it is, you know, if they're on their own, they will very happily go up to somebody, you know, a little person more often than not, and say, hey, you know, do you want to play? So somewhere along the line, we lose that inhibition and we become this shy individual, this individual that perhaps doesn't want to be seen to not have his own or her own community already. But if we don't have it, then you know, what have we got to lose by going up to someone and say, hey, you know, do you want to play with me? Because it works for the children. You know, they go from boredom to having a best friend all afternoon. So, so, so where is it along that line between being a child and being an adult that, that we lose that? Is that society? Is that just the way that we develop as people? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer, but it is, it is an interesting thing to have a think about. Talk about the, the, the people that you've taken up to the, to the summit of Everest and just think about the characters over the years you've worked with. I'm sure there's some, some very memorable. Uh, there's all sorts of people. I mean, I, not not it's got to do with famous or you know, I, I, I was behind getting Randolph Fiennes up there or so Randolph Fiennes, the, you know, Guinness Book of Records once said that, you know, the world's greatest living explorer. Quite how you quantify that, I never quite understood that. Um, 
But um, yeah, I, I took Randall Fines. I was behind here, his attempts in, I think, 2009 and 10. He finally summited in 2010. Uh, ben Fogel, 2018. Uh, that was a fantastic trip, actually. Um, re- you know, really enjoyed being around Ben. Um, a real positive, beautiful spirit that just wanted to get involved with everything. Yeah, and, and right, right down to you know, people that you know, have saved pretty much all their lives to, to go to Everest and to be there. Uh, and that's one of the things that I love about Everest, you know, you can have, you can be sat down in the, in the, in the mess tent, eating dinner, you know, in, especially now as a share base camp with, with other teams, you know, you can, you might get a hedge fund manager. You could have a, you know, a nurse or a doctor or a student. And it's, it's like we were saying earlier, there's that connection. We're all there for the same reason. And in that time that we're there, nobody's better or worse than anybody else. Everybody's on, on this equal, equal footing. And that's a really, really cool thing. You know, it's, it's, I think that's one of the great things about sport in general. Or you know, it just brings these people together. And when you're on the football field, it doesn't matter if you're a multi-millionaire or whether you're a pauper. In the moment, you're all equals doing the same thing. And, and that's that's one of the wonderful things about mountaineering. It, it is you know, this beautiful leveler brings people together. Yeah, unfortunately now we get Wi-Fi at base camp at Everest Base Camp, so everybody's kind of connected with other people. But traditionally it used to be playing cards or board games or, or simply storytelling, the art of storytelling. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, and that's been yeah, again, it's one of the lovely things which which attracts me to to, to the sport. The, the last few years you've seen a lot of people start to talk negatively about summiting Everest in a way that, well, everyone's doing it now. Have you seen the queues that are up there on top of the mountains? You know, it's it's clearly not as big, tough, dangerous as it was before. Why would you want to go and climb Everest? For goodness sake, everyone's done it. I mean, there's thousands of people every year. And I, I, I get a lot of feedback like that because I want to summit Everest. And so I get a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, but why would you want to do that? What do you say to people that 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 think like that or, or look at it in a negative way? Well, I, I think probably the most powerful way to answer that is, is to answer you, Spencer. You know, why is it that you want to attempt to climb Everest? Because I want, I want to do something that's, that's right now beyond me and I want to push myself and test myself in ways I haven't done and I would really love to make a phone call from the top of the world to say I'm standing on top of the world. Well, well there we go and, you know, and, and, and that's kind of your, your answer right there. Now, Everest is, will always be, certainly in our lifetime in the next like 50 million years, the highest point on the planet in the same way that the north pole is the most northerly and the south pole is the most southerly you know there will always be this attraction to go into these places and, and that's never going to diminish was it 70 odd years after its first ascent more people are wanting to climb everest now than ever before now it's very easy for detractors to say well it's overcrowded it's easier than it used to be and it's this and it's that yeah. But it's kind of the same with, with anything that we do. Technology helps, you know, better understanding of things, better equipment, um, you know, guides like myself, crack Sherpa teams, all making it possible for, you know, I use this term quite loosely, mere mortals, in air quotes, to go and climb Everest. But Everest is still a dangerous place, no matter how much resource, time, energy, tech you throw at it. And it's still the highest point on the planet. Now, everybody's got their own reasons for climbing Everest. And I like to consider myself as non-judgmental as I can be. But I also love that mountain. I love the Sherpa culture. Now, I love working alongside my Sherpa friends. Now, I love the the reset that being on the mountain gives me. You leave base camp, there's no 3G, 4G, there's no cell signal. No, it's a beautiful place to be. So then people go, yeah, well, what about all the queues on Everest? And I've climbed it 16 times. I've never queued 
on Everest, ever. There might be the occasional moment you've got to wait five, 10 minutes, you know, perhaps at the top of the Hillary step while somebody's coming up so you can go down. But that's hardly a cue. Now, Everest has this amazing ability to absorb a lot of people. There's only a few choke points. And if you're willing to make your own judgment, if you're willing to make your own call about when to climb and when not to climb, you can avoid those choke points. Now, this year on Everest, I think the first summit on Everest this year was uh, May 9th, I think, maybe 8th. And pretty much every single day after that was summited at summit ball. Of course, my tongue twister, summit a ball, which is quite unheard of. So the, the only reason you really get those cues that we famously see the pictures, I think NIMS, uh, NIMS dive took a photograph in 2018, I think it was 19, 2019, of that big long queue of people waiting to summit Everest. Okay. That only occurred because there was the, the, the weather the weather window. We can only climb Everest in a very short weather window. So I won't bore your listeners with why they come and go, but it's all to do with uh, the jet stream and the monsoon and the power play between these two epic weather systems. And sometimes you just get bad weather on that mountain. So everybody waits for that perfect moment. Well, when that picture was taken, I think it was May 24th that picture was taken. I was already back in the UK. Now, I'd summited really early with my client. I, you know, using the experience that I have and the Sherpa team have, you know, we chose perhaps a slightly less than perfect day. But in reality, by risking things a little bit more, it proved to be safer. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, mm. but by having the non-perfect day, by having... You know, perhaps a little bit more wind or whatever it may be, less people are inclined to climb. All of a sudden, taking away one of the biggest factors we have no control over, you know, what's the other person going to do? You know, control the controllables. That's what I always say. Control with what we can control minutely, perfectly well. And if you can do that, then it leaves your bandwidth but dealing with the, the side swipe, the uncontrollables, which unfortunately does include other less experienced teams on the mountain who are inclined to sometimes shortcut and make mistakes. So by avoiding the days that those individuals go or those teams go, makes it a lot safer. So we summited May 16th in 2019. I was back, you know, sipping my beer, you know, watching everything unfold from you know, the horror of my uh, of my laptop. Four people died that year in that queue that NIMS took a photograph of. How many people die on average each year? There's about six or seven on Everest. Okay. Um, and how many people attend the summit on every year? So, so this year there were 316 permits given to, you know, Western or, or clients. Uh, be a probably similar number of climbing Sherpas uh, accompanying them. So that would have been what this year, probably close to 700 people this year, perhaps a bit less. But there was only one death this year on Everest. It's one of the best seasons we've ever had. Every year, 70 to 100 people a year lose their lives in what's known as the Mont Blanc Massif. So that's like the mountain range around Chamonix in France, so Chamonix, Courmayeur, and places such as that. 70 to 100 people a year. Ski accidents, climbing accidents, walking accidents. You know, nobody really points a finger at Mont Blanc, do they? And go, oh my God, Mont Blanc, that's a really dangerous mountain. More people die on Mont Blanc every year than die on Everest. And Ten times more people die. That's really interesting. I didn't know that statistic. So for the people out there that sit talk negatively about Everest, it's way more dangerous in Mont Blanc. Many more people die. Talk to me about yeah, Mont Blanc, you know, the, 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 yeah. that, that, the Mont area per se. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, Mont Blanc's actually just been shut by the local mairie because of how dangerous it's got this year because of the super high temperatures and, and dry weather. Uh, Rockfall comes down what's known as the um, Grand Cour, and the, the mayor has deemed it so dangerous now, he shut the mountain. Wow. Okay. 
talk to me about life lessons. So you, how many people have you taken to the top of Everest over the years? Just give me a rough number. Oh, I don't know, uh, 30? 30. 30. 30. More than that? No, but, probably more than that. 40. And, and, I, I, I don't know. And, and you told me in our previous recording, which um, we can talk about a little bit, you, we, you talked to me about you building a relationship with each and every one of them. They almost become yeah. your friends. And, you know, because there's a lot of lead in time to them getting prepared for this. It goes over a couple of years. Now, after they come down from the summit and then they go back to their lives and you catch up with them, whether that's a week, a month or six months later, yeah. what, what has that experience taught them? climbing the top of the world what has that taught them um god that's a really good question um I, I think it's probably slightly different for each and every person um which i know is a really vague answer but you've got to consider that people are climbing the mountain for different reasons now that, that it's unfair to use ben fogel but let's use ben fogel as an example it it, it was his childhood dream it's been in the back of his mind since he was like, a young boy that one day he wants to climb Everest. And I wouldn't quite say his whole life has been leading towards this, but all of a sudden the opportunity comes, he fulfills that ambition and he did it really, really well. So for something like Ben, you know, to, to return back to uh, air quotes, normal life, you know, he, he's going to be riding a cloud of elation for quite some time. You know, that tsunami of, yeah, hey, you know, I, I did it. You know, dreams do come true. Whereas, you know, other people that I, I look after, you know, they, they have a very different outlook on things. So uh, my client this year, fantastic girl. Uh, I think she calls herself a uh, online fitness entrepreneur i mean absolutely crushing it with social media uh fitness videos and workouts and nutrition and all that sort of thing she went to everest for a very different reason you know partly to prove something to herself but also to gather content and inspire her own uh sort of followers and cohort and to show that you know you can achieve whatever you, you set out to do because rebecca you know, really had zero mountaineering background. So, you know, we had to train together over a number of years, get to know her really well before we went to that mountain. You know, on, on the back of her expedition, I would hope, um, I've not seen her, she lives in, in Florida, but I speak to her quite regularly. You know, I know, again, there's a level of elation of having done it, but she's gone there for a different reason. You know, she, she's now editing the film that we made while she was there. You know, she hopes to get that out and inspire you know, a whole genre of, you know, the, the, the predominantly females, but not exclusively, you know, young females that are suffering from confidence issues or eating disorders like Rebecca used to have herself and all these sorts of things. So, you know, it'd be interesting to speak to her in six months or a year's time to see what her experience on the mountain is like once uh, you know her production gets out there and it starts impacting other people and then you get people like Randall Fine who you know, it was just a logical step for him you know he's been to North Pole South Pole he's you know, circumnavigated the world by this that and other of course he was always going to climb Everest you now what how did he feel when he finished well he probably just always another job done uh, I think I think when, when you say that I think like when I, it, 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 when I accomplish something that I haven't done before and I feel it's like something for me major, it, it, it gives me further belief that nothing's impossible. And so that, that's quite a dangerous thing because if I was to get to the top of Everest, okay, and I have that belief that nothing's impossible, that can go in, in one of two different directions, you know. You could be almost reckless with you wanting to go out and achieve absolutely anything and everything. Do, do you ever get people that think like that? Yeah, I, I think a little bit. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, we're beginning to see it on 8,000 meter peak climbing. And we've already mentioned there's only 14 peaks in the world over 8,000 meters. And we do occasionally get people come to Everest. They climb Everest relatively smoothly. And they think, OK, well, what's next? Let's go and climb K2 or you know, Nanga Parbat, which is commonly known as the Killer Mountain, or, you know, or whatever it may be. And, yeah, and these mountains are very different to Everest. Everest is 
climb through you know sherpa power fixed ropes you know, normally pretty stable weather um you know these other mountains they're significantly more dangerous and i think there is that danger of hey i climbed Everest, i can do anything but and this is a big thing if that i can do anything is channeled in a positive way and that energy is put into you know whatever it may be now i'm arguably my most productive in terms of you know what i do with my other businesses when i come back from everest because i i have that confidence of wow yeah i am really good at what i do and I come back and I am super productive, I, uh, whether it's my you know, keynote speaking, the performance coaching company that I've got with my wife, you know, whatever it may be. I am super focused, my confidence is sky high, and that is a sweet point for anything that we do in life. Uh, I, I, I really think so. Not just professionally, but personally and within relationships as well. We, you know, we come back this buoyant, positive bundle of joy. And you know, every year I, I try to work out how I can cling on to that and keep that bubbling throughout the year. I think that's the power of climbing per se, not necessarily just Everest. When you, when you think of yourself, you've done, so, you've achieved so much in terms of adventure sports. Is there anything either within adventure sports or outside anything on this planet that you think, if only I was able to do that, or if I only I got round to do that, that would be just the best. Are you craving, you know, another fix? Is there something above and beyond what you've already done out there that makes you go, oh. or are you yeah, accomplished? I, I think we all have ambition, don't we? Uh, now, ambition changes throughout life um you know, i love rock climbing uh, this, it was my first touch point into into climbing mountaineering and i said about three or four years ago i wanted to climb a benchmark grade of 8a you know, if, if listeners are out there and or the audience out there if they climb they will know what 8a is so it's quite a high, what does that mean it's quite a high standard of rock climbing. It's not super high, but for the mere mortal, it's a hard standard of rock climbing. I've come close in the past. And I said about four or five years ago, by the time I'm 50, which unfortunately is next year, I will climb 8A. So I better pull my bloody finger out because I'm running out of time. Uh, and I'm going to need to train for that. I'm going to need to get back into climbing. I'm going to need to you know, look at my diet probably train overseas for a while so it's going to be very very selfish at the same time i think it's important that we have these challenges you know because they do add a modicum of purpose to what we do and something like or anything like this i think it's really important to be accountable as well so you know i started to tell people about you know, this is what i want to do uh and every now and then they check in with me you know how's it going and you know, hand up it's going pretty badly i keep getting sidetracked by climbing big mountains which is really bad for rock climbing <laughs> um so, so yeah there's loads of stuff that i want to do i mean i, I relatively you know, i've referenced it already relatively re recently launched in cool company which is a performance coaching company like right? you know business coaching mentorship because as I get older, I kind of realize one of my ambitions is to help other people. You know, I, I know you do it exactly this already, Spencer. And it, it, I can see it in my climbing. You know, I get as much personal satisfaction of being part of somebody else's fruition of a dream or of an ambition or going beyond what they thought they could do. Yeah, and my wife does a similar sort of thing. You know, she's you know she's a coach. Well, we're both accredited coaches, but you know she does a lot more of it than I do. And it's the same thing. You know, if, if I can influence other people in a commercial world, be it in a personal climbing world, or merge the two together, that I'm finding as I get older is so empowering. You know, I love it. I absolutely come back from Everest with you know, Rebecca or Ben Fogel or Michael Lavelle, whoever they are, and, and be part of that success. Even though I've climbed it 14, 15, 16 times, it doesn't matter because I'm now living vicariously through their success. 
and in a way, it doesn't even matter if I get to the top or not, because I am integral to their fulfillment. And, and, and that's, so it's taken me many years to understand that. And that's a wonderful thing. A lot of people out there I would describe, describe as just enoughers. All right. They live their life. They kind of go through life. They never push themselves. They never test themselves. They kind of get settled into a groove. And I find it a lot with um, bizarrely people that studied accountancy. They kind of get into it. They start, you know, get a degree in accountancy. They become an accountant at KPMG and they just kind of like they, 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 they chug along through life. And, and they never really test themselves or push themselves in a way that will give them a, you know, a, a new appreciation right. for life. You know, a good, a good example of this in a very, very simple way was we were filming in Nepal a couple of weeks ago. My daughter is at university at Met Film studying filmmaking. There is nothing you could tell her about making films. Nothing. Nothing. OK, she's, she's 20 years old. Nothing. Yeah. And. Yeah, I know you make films. That I know I know you're making a documentary, Dad, but, but, but let me tell you what me and my mates are doing at uni at the moment, the project, we're making a music video, and let me tell you about it, yada, 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 yada. You know nothing. She turns up in Nepal. First of all, she's never been to anywhere like that before. Secondly, she's with real pros, and I mean real pros, masters of their craft, producers, yeah. directors, d- directors of cinematography, all this kind of stuff. And she, the, she, she gets introduced to them, and at the end of the first day, she was saying to, to one of the guys, how do you get those angles? How, how, you know, it takes us a long time to set up to get those angles. How do you find the angle so easily? And the guy looked at her and he went, 25 years experience. And that's not what they're going to teach you at university. And all of a sudden, she kind of like wound her neck in and she realized that she was in the company of people that had something that she didn't have. And she came back from that experience and she's like, dad, I learned so much. I didn't realize that you were so good at making the kind of content you make. And I didn't realize that there was people around that, that were actually this talented and did this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Now I realize I know nothing. And it yeah. put her through, and she goes, then also when she, we, were, we were with the Badi community out in the, in the east of the country, she never seen poverty like that. And she goes, I, I realize mm. how lucky I am to have the life I've got. And I didn't realize I took it for granted. But I've also realized that I've got a lot to learn and I can't wait to get to that level. Having that type of exposure, I think, changes people. And I think that's what mountaineering does. And I'm not suggesting anyone climbs to the top of Everest. But anyone could train to go to the top of Kilimanjaro, couldn't they? And having... So if anyone could train to go to the top of Kilimanjaro, which is the biggest mountain in Africa, if people could do that, then I think it would change how they see their own life and how they, they see the environment they live in. And it would, would give them a kickstart to maybe a happier, more engaging, more fulfilling future. You, do you agree with me? Yeah, I think it's very complicated. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot there that we can look at and pick apart and talk about. Um, I mean, first and foremost, fantastic that your daughter's had that eye opener because it, it, it's a journey, you know, and it's, uh, I forget who wrote it, uh, it's a book called Expert, and it talks about the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master. And by the sounds of it, your daughter had that epiphany, that moment of, huh, Okay, so there is this apprenticeship that I need to serve. And only when you serve the the apprenticeship do you then potentially break out on your own and start carving that your own journey, you know, the journeyman, which puts you on the pathway to mastery, which is where, by the sounds of it, some of the other um, members of the film crew are either, you know, quite senior in their in their journeyman pathway or they're actually at mastery already. But it's having that understanding and the lack of arrogance to realize that that pathway exists. But not everybody wants to embark on it. You know, not everybody wants to go along and become you know, a master or whatever they do. And you know, I use the term master you know, quite loosely. It's just a term, terminology used in the book. Um, you know, a lot of people are quite happy to, to sit you know, as an apprentice or you know, part way on the journeyman status and just go through the motions, get the paycheck on a, on a Friday and, and do it all again this, the, the next week. And you now I've worked with some of these people. You know, I, I spent time working with a Mancunian steeplejack company. I, I did a two or three years for them. Um, I was using it as 
like an extension to my apprenticeship, I suppose, because I knew I, I, I kind of knew the pathway that I wanted to take. And you know, I, I, I took this job with the steeplejacks as a stepping stone. But some of those steeplejacks have been there for decades and they were quite happy in that in that moment. You know, they would go to the pub you know, on the Thursday night and the Friday night and the Saturday night and drink 10 pints or whatever it is. And hey, you know, I don't think it's our position to be judgmental. However, sometimes we're in that lovely situation where we can enlighten by bringing somebody along with us, you know, to experience our own, you know, part of our own journey. And we let them see with their own eyes what the possibility is for them as individuals. And I think if we can do that, then all of a sudden, those people who are very content with perhaps what they, what they currently have, do then begin to strive to experience other things. And then the other thing which I think you, you, you hit upon there quite succinctly was the, you know, the, the tribe or the, uh, the um, social caste that you were with in Nepal, the baddie people who are pretty much at the bottom of the caste system. So if people don't know, the caste system is this well, it, pretty much hereditary. It's very much set in stone. Depending what caste you are born in, it will dictate where you can live, what jobs you can have, what your social status is, who you can marry or can't marry. And it's you know, alive and very much kicking in places like Nepal and India and uh, parts of Pakistan. And the baddie people are about the lowest of the low in terms of caste. I think you said yourself, you know, they are the dust on the floor in terms of the caste system. So to go to somewhere like that and realize how damn lucky we are, not just to you know, be middle class or whatever we, you know, but to actually live in the UK or the Middle East where you are now and to have the opportunity that we have. I mean, Jesus, if, if you can go and hang out with, you know, any low car system or just go and hang out in Kathmandu or Delhi, which I know are multiple rungs up from a baddie village, just go and hang out there for a little while and then come back to the UK and say that you've got it bad. Because one thing that I've really learned from travel is how damn lucky we are. Mm. Really lucky. Okay. You know, our political system might be going down the poop tube, you know, inflation's going high and you know, be austerity and all those sorts of things. But I live in a beautiful house. I've mean, got a house over my head. I mean, that's a good damn start. Uh, it's, oh, yeah, I get quite cross when people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, go travel and go, ex go experience for a moment what other people have or don't have. And then that will completely reset, you know, our, our own understanding about what's good, bad, or, or you know, we've been dealt a bad, you know, a bad hand. Well, nobody deals as a bad hand. You know, we're in control of that. Yeah. So, you know, and then, you know, places where most of this audience are listening, I'm guessing anyway, mm -hmm. you know, we've got opportunity all around us. It's down to us to go out and, and, and grab it with two hands. No, we don't want to. That's yeah, but you know fine. what? It's interesting you say this because, and, and we, I know we're coming to the close of this interview, but it's like if I'm in a restaurant and my wife chooses a dessert and she thinks it's delicious, she'll go, "Oh, taste, taste, taste have a taste of that." And I'm like, "No, it's all right. Actually, I've got this ice cream. Okay, no, 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 no. You should really taste it. It's really nice." And I'm like, "No, no, no. I'm fine there. No, Spencer, this is the best lemon meringue pie ever made. Taste it." I have that with, with, with being in the outdoors i have that with people going and seeing the world it's kind of like for me it's like i have this urge to kind of like to 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 to, to want to push people down to try different things because most people don't the steeplejacks go to the pub on a thursday friday saturday night and drink 10 pints because they know no different they don't know any different and a lot of them if they tried different things they would experience so many great different experiences now it might lead them back to four nights a week drinking pints in the pub might do but for the vast and majority, that's and that's fine. Yeah, that, but that's, that's fine because it's an individual choice. But the vast majority you know, of people it, are changed from changed experiences. The vast majority of people, yeah. you know, the first time I went up to Everest Base Camp, I just sat there at Gorak Shep looking at the top of that mountain, and I'm like, holy macaroni. Oh 
this is incredible. And I'm like, how much further to get up there then? They went, it's another three and a half kilometers. And I'm like, part of me was like, that's not far. The other part of me was, that's like, that's far than, than you could ever imagine. You know, you're at five kilometers now, you've got three and a half kilometers till you get there. And I'm like, don't know what to do with that. But it just left me there spellbound. And, and, and you know, I lived in Nigeria as a kid and people say, describe Nigeria. Oh, wow. And I'm like, I can't. You have to go and Hail. see it. You have to see it, you have to smell it, you have to feel it. If you go there, you'll get what I get about it. And it's like going up to, to Everest and being there. It's like, you've got to go see it, you know? And people say, why do you climb mountains? Go see it, go experience it, and then you'll know. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's very hard to say what it is, because it, it's no one thing. Yeah, and I, I think I think you, you hit the nail really, really nicely there. It's, you know, I, I keep referring back to children, you know, and we keep losing this thing. Children will pretty much try anything, you know, at least once, you know, just to get a, a feel for whatever it is. I mean, we're, we're pretty much born on this planet with very little fear. You know, fear is something that we, we somehow learn along the way. And you know, unfortunately, it would inhibit a lot of us from trying things. But generally, everything that, you know, Generally, everything we do is comparatively safe. It may push us outside of our comfort zone. We may not enjoy it. It may be physically hard. It may be mentally hard. But that's how we grow. And that's how children grow and develop, by trying stuff. It's like, oh, I didn't like that. Or, ah, that burnt me. Or, ah, I got stung by a bee. Or, ah, fell out of the tree. Bloody broken my leg. Now, let's try and stuff. And they grow and develop into you know, the people that we are today. And again, somewhere along the line, we lose it. And we go, oh, I'm not going to do that. No, uh, I don't like that. Or, you know, I, 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 I don't want to go to India because I don't like the food. Well, I mean, India is a great place. Yeah, there's lots of different foods you can get in India. Or, I mean, I don't want to get it's too hot. Or, you know, I don't, don't want to go to the snow. It's too cold. Or it's like, well, just try. And, and you, know, you might just go back to drinking 10 pints, like you say, in the pub. But by taking this opportunity... And, and let's face it, you know, let's go back to the baddie people. They don't have the opportunity to try stuff. So, you know, by not trying things, we're, we're, we're almost disrespecting all those millions of people that don't have the opportunity. We have the opportunity. And it's so disrespectful if we at least don't try. You know, if we waste those opportunities, then, yeah, I think, I think it's, you know... It, well, I, I can't get my head around it. I mean, I, I'm I'm one of these people that are constantly trying stuff, and you know, I, I try that. I like, well, you know. Last question: Who's your biggest inspiration? Who's the person that you look at? Who inspires the living daylights out of you? Oh my God, I'm only know one person. Um, Christ. Um, okay, he's super controversial, but I think Elon Musk. You know, he's a guy that okay, let's put his politics to one side and his whole Twitter thing right now. But there's a guy that just doesn't know any boundaries. He's like. I want to try that. I want to put somebody on Mars. You know, I'm going to build a rocket. He, he just goes ahead and bloody does it. You know, Tesla cars. You know, I want to. I, I want to do something good for the environment. I'm going to develop a an electric car. Now, it's somebody that just has his mindset about just doing things. Uh, perhaps on a slightly lower level, um, you know, Richard Walker, the uh, current CEO of Iceland. Remember the Iceland supermarkets, yeah. all frozen stuff. You know, some of the stuff that Richard is doing with his father, so his family-owned business, in terms of the environment, it's just incredible, like right? banning plastics and, you know, palm, push against palm oil and all these things. It's so inspiring when people actually go out there and action what they think and say. And I think both Musk and Richard Walker, they're, they're both epic at doing that. Okay, Nobody's perfect. I get you that. But and, you know, at least they're bloody trying, you know. And then, you now in the climbing world and sports world, well, I mean, it's almost nose nose bounds. Anybody that's high achieving, I just think is epic, absolutely epic. But to, you know, because of the commitment it takes to get there, you know, I just, I just admire it. I really do. Um, well, well, look, Kenton, cool. I'm a green eyed monster around you. I'm incredibly envious of the life that you have led. 
and I'm also incredibly inspired by the life that you lead. So very, very, thank, thank you so much for coming to share your time with us on the show today. It really has been really interesting talking to someone who's as humble when you've achieved so much and you've got great advice and wisdom for everybody listening and watching today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, Spencer. Thank you for having me. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Kenton's a really great guy and someone I've really got a great amount of value out of. You know, I'm passionate about climbing myself, but I haven't been anywhere close to what he's done. Hopefully time will allow me to do that. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, you're watching it now on YouTube, you can click over here and you can get more episodes or you can click here and subscribe. And if you subscribe there, you'll get every episode. As soon as I make it and post it, it'll come to you straight away. So do me a favor, subscribe to the show and make sure you get further episodes of the podcast. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Kenton's a really great guy and someone I've really got a great amount of value out of. You know, I'm passionate about climbing myself, but I haven't been anywhere close to what he's done. Hopefully time will allow me to do that. If you're listening to this right now on iTunes, then please leave me a five-star rating. I'd really appreciate it. It would help more than you know. And on other podcasting platforms, show some love, give some feedback. As I say always, what do I do well? What do I not do well? How can I improve? And how can I bring guests to you? Who would you like me to interview? Somebody I haven't interviewed before. If I can find that person, get hold of that person because you want me to, I will do my best to bring them onto this show. See you on the next episode.